Great. Um, well, welcome to, um, I guess, what we call the penultimate panel um, of the conference. And I'm really excited to, to be here with my fellow panelists who will introduce themselves in a moment. I'm Kate Asher, uh, the Milstein Professor of Urban Development at Columbia. Um, and we're going to focus on um, some of the kind of community development issues that um, relate to this particular moment moment in time. So before we get started um, digging into some questions, let me ask my fellow panelists to introduce themselves. Cecilia, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Cecilia Kushner. I work for the Economic Development Corporation in New York City. Um, we are an arm of um, the New York City government. Our mission is to create shared prosperity across the New York City five boroughs by creating good job and strengthening neighborhood. And I'm the executive vice president for planning, which is responsible for um, um, place-based strategic planning from vision to execution. So great to be here. Thank you, Kate. Great. Thanks, Cecilia. How about you, Ernst? Uh, good morning. Uh, Ernst Valerie. Um, I am an alumni of uh, alumnus of uh, the um, MSRED program. I am the president and uh, co-managing member of SAA EVI. We're real estate developers. And I kind of tell folks we're not one product or the other. We're, we're community developers and we really believe in development without displacement. And so we, in our toolkit, we have affordable housing, we have market rate housing, we have you know small retail, we have large retail. So we kind of do it all and partnership with community. Great, and last but not least, Cecily. Hi everyone, my name is Cecily King. I am also an alum of the MS Red program, class of 2015. I am also currently an adjunct um, teaching in the program as well. So life has come a little bit of full, full circle for me. Um, I am the founder of a real estate development and consulting firm um, called Kipling Development. Um, I primarily do a lot of work in Detroit and New Jersey. Um, I spent the last six years of my career um, doing development in Detroit, specifically around um, residential, whether it be affordable, mixed income, or um, market rate. And right now, my focus as a developer is specifically on home ownership and the intersection of affordable home ownership with the rest of the market um, in Detroit. Um, so I definitely want to talk more about that in today's panel. Great. Well, we have we should have a nice spread here um, between my um, development work in upstate New York, Detroit, Ernst, who's in many places, including Baltimore, and Cecilia, who really covers New York City for us. Um, so let's let's dig right in. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about this particular moment in time and everything that's happened this year. Um, you know, not just the pandemic. Um, not just the Black Lives Matter movement, but really all these big changes combined. Um, there's been so much of a focus on equity and uh, inequitable outcomes in, in, in many aspects of life. And I think it's an interesting time um, to ask people like you who work at the forefront of community development, um, to what extent are these disparities in wealth and access that the last year has highlighted in so many ways to what extent do you feel that they are actually reflected in or reflective of the structure of the real estate industry itself? Which I know is a very big question, but I think it's something that, you know, as a sort of year of self-reflection is important to at least talk about and think about with a wider audience. So um, Cecily, maybe do you want to start? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I think there's two two things that your your question brings to mind for me. Um, I think the last year, um, when we talk about just equity and ownership, I think it's really laid bare the disparity between rentership and the vulnerability that people were the vulnerable place that people were left in um, over the course of the past year. Frankly, through no fault of their own, and contrast that with um, some of the just asset appreciation that homeowners saw. Um, right now, I'm in northern New Jersey, and we saw a huge influx of people, mostly from Brooklyn, bidding up home values um, to a point that, you know, even the home that my husband and I own here appreciated were probably 25%. But if we were renters, we would have been left in a situation where 
Um, maybe our landlord wanted, I, I think we, we saw what happened with a lot of renters that's, and it's frankly still playing out when it comes to just stays on, on evictions, um, the moratoriums that ex expired or been confusing across the country. And I think that, that, that disparity there, I think we definitely saw play out in the news. I think the second piece for me, and this is more broad, when we talk about equity, we're often talking about dollars and wealth creation, but one of the things and one of the reasons why I founded my firm is that I think equity is not just about dollars, it's also about representation. And I think the way that we approach projects is different than when I, when I look like the people that I'm developing for. Really interesting. Um, interesting thoughts there. Ernst, what, um, what is your take on um, what this last year should make us think about and reflect on as we kind of help, you know, certainly students at Columbia and elsewhere move into the real estate industry? Yeah, and, and you know, um, I think a lot of students going to Columbia or going to different uh, real estate programs, especially students of color and women uh, and immigrants, um, they, they get a different kind of welcome into the real estate industry on the other side once they've graduated. And I, I feel that they haven't had the access to become entrepreneurs because no one's investing in them. So Real estate is very traditional because it's tied to the traditional financial or financing systems. And so banks and, um, you know, the big financial powerhouses and the equity folks out there, they are not investing in women. They are not investing in black and brown people and they're not investing in immigrants. And that's just a fact. Uh, and I feel that you know, as a person of color, you can get all the degrees you want. At the end of the day, uh, you know, you really have to just fight for um, a spot as like a middle manager. You're not going to be the top of the company. Uh, and so I think um, one of the things, you know, at Columbia that's been highlighted because a lot of black and brown people are like, well, should I go to Columbia? Because am I going to have access and opportunity on the other side to be an entrepreneur. And I think entrepreneurship is the only way we counterbalance this traditional system that says, we don't wanna give you access. And so, you know, there are so many talented women, so many talented people of color. Should we really be asking for access in a system that doesn't want us? Or should we be, you know, carving a path, a different path, because uh, I think to, to change everything that's been highlighted with COVID, with the Me Too movement, uh, and, and with the Black Lives Matters movement is how do we finance another platform, another direction for very talented people? Should they really be uh, seeking opportunities with people that don't want them, that don't value them? Um, and who plan to use them, use their gender, use their uh, color to say, we've got this, but not really give them opportunity and to, um, so I think that's the direction that we need to head. Uh, we need to uh, disrupt the system and real estate development is community development. Like development doesn't happen in a vacuum anymore. You don't go in the middle of the forest and like, or, you know, deal with a farmer and do a subdivision, all development is happening in communities. People already exist there. And so if you can't tread those waters, I think you're on the wrong side of history when it comes to the path that our career is in, like our field is heading into. And we also have to change um, the outlook, how people see developers. People see developers as very evil people. And that's because they're not from the community. They, they just drop in and they've got capital and they've got access and they're developers. I think that should be a moral value, a value system to development. And you know, the people who are gonna lead that are women, uh, people of color and uh, immigrants because they, that's where development is happening. Right. I wanna come back to a couple of points you made um, because I do wanna um, come back and think about the role of um, education in real estate and how we attract people into it. But I want to pivot for a second and ask um, Cecilia something something different. As we think about um, what's happened this year, we think about communities um, and we think about how um, communities have struggled to support their members who faced all kinds of challenges with unemployment, health issues. Um, we, we've seen the disparity between wealthier and poorer communities play out in a in a, a very dramatic way, I sort of wonder 
um, what kind of thinking you or the city are doing about how to make these neighborhoods and these communities um, stronger, more resilient. And I don't mean from flooding and climate change. I mean, in a social sense, the sorts of bonds and support that we've seen is was needed this year to really just get us through, um, you know, the, uh, as, as the queen would say, Annis Horribles, um, this really confluence of, of terrible events. So I just wonder what your thoughts are um, on, on, you know, how we might make more complete some of these neighborhoods that, um, that are not. That's right. And just also picking back on, on what um, Cecilia and Ernst were saying, I think like the recovery cannot be a return to normal. I think the last year has really shown that there are um, kind of like fundamental infrastructure issues to how people do throughout neighborhoods. And you're totally right that like we've seen that um, there's been a really very acute geographical impact of both like the health issues and the economic issues. And so um, it, it, it is not like, it, there's definitely a difference on how like this has played out for individuals and communities. Um, I think what it has really shown is that there's a number of what we, what I would call like systems of infrastructure um, that really make a community resilient, both financially or from a health perspective um, that we've seen perform or not perform at all. I mean, one kind of like really important example is broadband, for example, and how you could be in New York City and be a neighborhood that doesn't have access to like good quality Wi-Fi, which completely impacted your ability to access any kind of services, even like testing and health services, or for your kids to be able to do remote schooling. Um, so like that is one aspect, for example, that the city is deeply looking at saying like, it is not enough that we have like 80% of New Yorkers that have access to broadband because for the 20% that don't, there's really a, a complete breakdown in a lot of like city services and infrastructure that happens to them during a moment of crisis. Um, we've also looked um, like the, the open restaurant was a huge opportunity in New York City for businesses to be able to pivot and continue to have some level of income and reinvent themselves at a time where it was not possible to eat indoors. But we saw how difficult it was for some communities or some entrepreneurs to be able to adapt, uh, you know, or just put out front the amount of money that was necessary for them to be compliant with the regulations. Um, so one of the things we did, for example, is partner with um, uh, uh, the AIA in New York City. So we set up like a, a bunch of pro bono volunteer designers that gave their time and their expertise to local restaurants throughout the entire city to tell them this is how you should read the regulations on how to do open restaurants so they could avoid fines and so they could be open really quickly. So I think we're beginning to see how there has to be more partnership between the non-for-profit sector, the private sector, and the city to really get at like very targeted set of policies and technical support that an infrastructure investment that need to be um, done in a number of neighborhoods throughout the city. And so everyone has an opportunity to actually be able to withstand and become more resilient to systemic shocks, which is seems to be how the 21st century is going to play out between climate change, pandemics, like, you know, um, cycles of uh, economic downturns, like managing crisis and be able to, um, to be resilient economically and from a health perspective are, are just really important features of neighborhood success moving forward and, and something we're really beginning to look into. And I guess while we're on that topic, one of the questions I have is, I know there's a, in theory, an infrastructure bill brewing in Congress, um, you know, who knows if it will make it out. Um, but, but I'm wondering um, from a, a city perspective in any of the cities where you guys work, but, but really starting with New York, um, how, how um, is any of this new thinking about infrastructure, about physical infrastructure, about the way streets are used, about the importance of parks, about transit, and the fact that, you know, literally the New York City subway system, for example, was never fully built out. And there are communities that are nowhere near it, um, that find it very hard to get, you know, access to, to work. Um, is there any thinking that some of the interventions or some of the innovations that were explored during this period might have lasting lessons and actually kind of change 
the way we look at investment in those areas and how we utilize um, that kind of real estate. I mean, like Subway is a perfect example. It's been fascinating to see has like ridership has completely plummeted. Who is still using the system? And so you really see these neighborhoods that have really tragically um, suffered from COVID, but at the same time where you have high concentration of essential workers and these are the stations and the lines where you see um, like really large ridership and then the lines and the neighborhoods that used to feed a lot of like the Manhattan to, you know, um, other boroughs kind of commute to Midtown and lower Manhattan, you've seen a steep decline. And so that has to make you rethink about like where does investment in infrastructure and in transportation infrastructure, as you said, in some neighborhoods where like New Yorkers have to commute an extremely long amount of time um, are actually invested in. So I think like looking a lot um, at what the city can control as we don't control the MTA, but one, now like we looked at like select bus services or investment in, in biking or any kind of transportation infrastructure the lens of like who actually traveled a lot during the last year and who was able to actually function fairly well in the neighborhood that they were in and from home. I think it's like a, a totally new type of data on, on like where investment is actually the most useful. That's a really interesting data point, Cecilia. Um, just thinking about the, that concentration of essential workers and where investment in things like transit actually happen. I think the other thing that brings to mind for me is parks um, and access to open space, because I think we also saw um, a, a varied experience in terms of just an outlet for people, for kids to play, for people to have some type of social interaction in what was felt to be a safe space based on the, their access to a place like to, to green space or parks or public space or whatever it was for someone and what, what that investment then looks like. Because I think um, oftentimes I think more well-to-do communities have private open spaces and public. And so that investment in public spaces in neighborhoods where it really, really matters, what does that look like going forward? I think the other, the other thing that I've seen for me um, in places like Detroit um, is with restaurants not being able to operate in the building, actually spilling out onto the street and taking up part of the street. Um, granted, it's coupled with, you know, decreased transportation. There's not as much people, not as many people moving around in the same way, but it was a really effective way to have more of this inside, outside, more social environment, more social interaction. Um, I don't know that it's a permanent change because when people start moving around and cars come back and, you know, like that, that frequency and density of travel picks up again, I don't, I think there's a middle ground there where we saw that maybe we don't need as much as we've been using, and maybe we can, you know, decrease what streets look like and what road use looks like or change how it looks. Um, I don't think it's going to stay exactly the way it is, but I do think we saw some really cool test. Um, we, were, we were forced to, 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 to test in very interesting ways. Fascinating. Um, you know, Detroit is an interesting case because um, I've been fascinated by the transportation infrastructure of Detroit or lack thereof. Um, and I just, I just, <laughs> wonder, um, you know, Cecily, if you want to just expand on that a little bit more and think about the tie between development and transportation infrastructure. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like because so much of Detroit, you know, sort of moved out into the suburbs because there was so little investment in the center city, um, what attempts were made to, to really invest in transit Interestingly, some of the public ones went nowhere. Now there's some private investment. And I'm just wondering, maybe a little bit cynically, um, you know, how we think about transit, how we might think about transit oriented development in communities that really, um, you know, require, require support to, um, to continue moving forward. No, I think it's interesting because I think some of the public and private transit investment, uh, investment in transit in Detroit has been very high dollar and not a very extensive um, impact in terms of distance, in terms of ridership. Um, but I've, I've actually, so I, I spent a lot of time in Richmond, Virginia, and they had this really interesting um, just bus rapid transit down their main corridor that they've put in in the last five years. That's really impactful. And so this idea of like permanent infrastructure 
that's very high ticket and completely trans where you have to putting in rails is very different than putting in some bus stops and running a bus and putting some paint down and running a bus. And so thinking more strategically about how we, what transit investment actually means, there's some very good case studies in very recent years that could be applied in places like Detroit, in my opinion. Yeah, a very, a very good example. Ernst, I don't know, you're smiling. I, didn't yeah, no, I've, I've, you know, I work in Richmond, Virginia, and I've been to Detroit. And, you know, it's whose transit is it and what is it being used for? So, like, you know, my observation in Detroit is that, you know, there's two billionaires downtown that have, like, created a little bubble for themselves and, like, they fill their investment gaps with their, each other's foundations and they have built a little thing just for them. And, and it's on purpose. They want to keep all the undesirables uh, in, in their minds away from that. And that's why their transportation downtown does not connect to the people. Um, and it's an extremely very difficult place to, uh, uh, to do business because you know, everything is insider trading in Detroit, in my opinion. Uh, and then you, you go to Virginia, uh, or Richmond, Virginia, and you've got great leadership uh, with Mayor Stoney there. And you know, he's really about all people. Right? It's like, how do I connect my entire city and all of my people will, were one Richmond. And it's, it's, it's sort of like the, you know, the tension between North and South. Like we, we always get this idea that, you know, we're so liberal in the North and they're so, you know, um, something different in the South, right? That they're, they're, they're racist, they're this, they're that. And we always find examples of people coming together and actually wanting to be together in the South uh, and actually knowing and learning how to, you know, deal with each other. And then in, in the North, we say all the right things, uh, but, you know, through our zoning, through our transportation, uh, we're really um, disinvesting in people and we're still sort of like perpetrating this idea of redlining. We just do it in such clever ways now, uh, you know, it's, 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 you know, racism and sexism and neo xenophobia has like this really elevated language. And so you think, wow, we're really so uh, advanced in the North and it's, it's, it's simply not the case. You know, it's funny, you mentioned, mentioned redlining. And one of the things I thought I wanted to touch on with you, with you guys in this moment of, um, you know, concern over equitable outcomes is, is the issue of, of um, gentrification. Um, and and displacement that it sometimes can bring. And, you know, Detroit's an interesting question about what does it mean that there is this um, very spiky investment downtown. Um, but but I, I sort of wonder when I look at places, you know, in New York and other cities that I travel to that have been, um, have forms of uh, transportation or other investment that have um, started, you know, moving them forward. I'm thinking particularly about um, the overground in London and other things are communities that were cut off that are starting to come back. What's happening in places like that is it is inevitably uh, displacing people because property values are going up in part because of this new access and it becomes a hip place to live. And we know all the examples. And I'm, I'm just interested in, in your view, Ernst, and, and the others about how you um, move forward with investing in these communities without um, necessarily displacing uh, many of the folks who've lived there a very long time. The way we work is uh, going into those communities and, you know, creating opportunities for affordable housing, workforce housing, and jobs, right? Uh, entrepreneurship opportunities for the people who are there before you necessarily come in and you do some of the market rate and the, the higher income stuff. Um, and so if, if you're really in for that community, you meet that community where it is, and then you use density as a tool to add more people. Um, you know, gentrification, if, if you take out the displacement, uh, it's actually a good thing. It's amenities and resources coming into the community. Uh, it's, it's just, you know, the way it's been applied, right? It's like, we all have processes. It's how the process is applied. If it's up applied in a very uneven and unfair way where it targets a certain person or it excludes a certain person, then that application is wrong and it's uh, effectively un-American in my opinion. 
Um, but if we apply it in an even way and we say, okay, there's vulnerable people, how do we take care of the most vulnerable people? And so that's the way we, we approach development. How do we take care of the most vulnerable people in that community? And, you know, in a place like Baltimore, there are vacants and there's, you know, you can do so much infill development and every zip code actually deserves investments. And what traditional markets do is, you know, you're never going to accuse a bank of being like uh, creative and thinking out of the box, right? And so, like, they just want to invest in what they know, right? And so, like, what they know is, you know, uh, you know, the traditional sort of like upper middle class family. It's not even the middle class family, right? The middle class family in this country has been completely ignored. And you have places like Philadelphia, like Baltimore, uh, where, you know, a lower and middle kind of class family can get a $200,000, $300,000 beautiful home that's connected to transit. And that zip code is valid, but our traditional financial systems won't invest in those places. And so that's where I think we have to pivot and find different and more creative uh, ways of financing and as developers, we have to be the advocates for these communities, right? And we're the ones that speak to the banks. We're the ones that convince them um, that, you know, people are worth it. And, you know, ultimately development has to change. It can't, it can't stay the way it is. There's so much tension and that tension is just going to boil over. And, um, you know, you're, you're going to have the continued pandemic of, you know, sexism and, and, and racism in this country and uh, xenophobia. Like, it's, it's still happening now. You know, administration change hasn't, you know, abated the issue. Yeah, it's interesting. And, I, I, I you know, if access to capital is an issue um, to be able to do the types of projects that you're talking about, um, how do we how do we tackle that? I mean, we all understand why banks do what they do. It's safe, it's within their rules. And, you know, it's the free market, um, uh, you know, at work. But, but clearly your point is that it isn't working for a large part of the American population. So, you know, Cecily, I don't know um, from your experience what, what, you know, you bring up the issue of um, wealth creation as well, which is of course related in these neighborhoods, but how do we, how do we address the issue of access to capital for the types of um, projects that Ernst is talking about? Because as a developer, you can you can you know have your heart in the right place, but if you can't get financial support, you know you're not going to be able to do a project. So I'm just wondering what your experience has been and what your thoughts are. Yeah, no, I definitely have some very fresh thoughts on this on this topic because I'm in the middle of a project right now in Detroit. Um, it's a mixed income for sale condominium project. And so 25% of the units are reserved for households that make 80% 80, 80 AMI or below. Um, there are resources from the public side that could really complicate the capital stack that could help fund this project. But given the size of it, and I've worked on the public side, I would like to figure out how to do it without public investment because I think that's the more sustainable approach to this. Um, and part of it for me has been strategic on the neighborhood and what the market rate comps are versus the 80% AMI sale price. And that helps to solve from a math perspective how the project can work. But I've really been um, you know, having a lot of conversations with lenders both in the CDFI and the non-CDFI community with equity investors, et cetera, especially over the past year. And everyone's very, very interested. But to Ernst's point, every and banks invest in what they know. They have, you know, a regulatory environment that they've created. There's, you know, certain underwriting criteria that they're using. And yeah, it's super interesting, but how do we marry it with the process that we have in place? Um, and so for me, a lot of it has, has really been, I would say the CDFI community probably has the most flexibility when it comes to um, sources of dollars that are going into a fund to be used for mission-driven investment. Um, and then there's a specific type of um, investor or a specific type of equity partner that's interested in, in that is really trying to operationalize some of these changes um, that need to happen. And I think in, 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 from my perspective, the last year has, again, exacerbated what people are seeing and has made people interested in figuring out how to solve some of these more systemic problems. You know, it's interesting. Go ahead, Cecilia. 
And just like two things that we've tried to do at EDC to get to, um, to this issue. I think for us generally, because in New York City, we don't have a lot of land um, left. Each project has to be large, especially if it's an affordable housing project, just to maximize the number of units that we can get there. Um, and, uh, and each project is generally very complex because you're on the waterfront, so you need to create like some open space or the site is highly contaminated. So it's really hard for kind of like emerging developers to be able to bid on projects like that because like you're not going to break ground for the next five to six years and you need a capital stack that is like incredibly complex. And so we've tried two things. The first one is like an emerging developer loan fund. Um, so for smaller projects, it's actually we provide the capital up front, we provide the technical assistance. And so we give them the time to be able, but like we're the first in. And so we give like um, a private financial institution, like the, the, the trust that there is like the city is actually, you know, like investing in this company. Another thing we've done is just kind of like through the bidding process and the RFP process, just really look at like forcing ventures between a large, you know, experienced developer that can build a capital stack and can stay on the site for like a decade before they, like we actually close on it and a more emerging developer that wouldn't have the ability to bid as a prime developer, but who's gonna gain immense kind of experience and know-how and the ability to be able to say that like they've built a capital stack on such a large project at the end of the day. So it's just really looking at like, who do we give opportunities to and that being a goal in addition to actually building affordable housing, but just like making the field more diverse, which is better for the city at the end of the day, because if it's more competitive, we get also more for our money and we have more chances to do great projects. But just making sure that these two goals are happening in parallel has been like just really important. And I think will continue to be really important for the field. I mean, There's I one point I wanted to go back to, um, Kate, because you had asked the question about displacement, and I actually had a thought about that, that what your, your comment just now, Cecilia, triggered, um, and it's about how do you, I think you had asked, how do we um, prevent displacement when investment is happening? I think Ernst gave a really insightful, um, gave a, had a really insightful comment about it's not the investment that's the problem, it's the displacement that's the problem. Um, and for me, I think one thing that I've seen is the difference that ownership makes. So if you are an owner of property in a place where investments is happening, everyone wants to live somewhere that is desirable. And if your property value goes up, you're, you're creating wealth for people. But I think oftentimes when we're talking about housing and we're talking about affordability, and we're talking about investment, we're talking about rentership, we're talking about affordable housing as a rental option and not necessarily keeping people in place through actual ownership. I think affordable housing is great in that there, you know, there's 30 plus year, you know, deed restrictions, 50 years, whatever. But at the end of the day, it's, there's still a timestamp on there. And if we look back 50 years, we're talking about urban renewal. We're talking about redlining. We're talking, so what, what, what does it look like in 50 years? It's still not a permanent solution. So I think there's the, I 100% agree with what you're saying about the scale of developer and the um, emerging developer and 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 um, access to capital. But then going back to that that conversation about displacement is what we're building actually going to solve an issue. It it's solving it now, but is it going to solve it in the future, or are we just kind of pushing off the the, the finish line on that? Yeah, and I think like another. I think it's it's hard to um, if you want to talk about like wealth building and economic stability for, for um, as a goal and like as like the actual like intergenerational outcome of our work, right? And of what real estate development can offer is both the housing side and, and, and most Americans pass wealth to their kids through, you know, like the equity that is in their home. That is like how the American dream is being built financially. Um, and there's also, I mean, for us, um, uh, there's also like how do you get folks into um, like growth industry that are going to be part of the expansion of the economy and actually gonna allow them to enter the middle class that then will give them the equity to be able to become a homeowner. Um, so I think it has to be both the housing stability and the community stability, as well as ensuring that, and for, for us in New York, it's like, it's tech, um, it's like cybersecurity is a huge, you know, um, growing industry. It's life science. 
So how do you make sure that native New Yorkers that are making their way through like high school and through CUNY, you know, which is like the, the community college or like the college system that really um, brings a lot of um, lower income New Yorkers into uh, the middle class are actually poised to get these folks into these industries because these are the industries that are actually gonna create like the 21st century middle class in the city. Um, so we do a lot of work also around like internship, entrepreneurship, um, just making sure that as these industries are taking a foothold in New York City, they're not, not just thinking of New York City as like a global center, but actually as a place that has residents um, and have a responsibility for making sure that these residents enter this industry. And so I think it's like also leaning in as to where the market is on jobs and making sure that that, that is part of the equation. That, that's a great point. I want to go back um, and pick up on something that um, that Ernst mentioned. Um, I, I'm interested in in the job um, uh, sort of faucet for for folks coming into the real estate industry. How do we get people into the real estate industry as small developers to take advantage of the kinds of programs that Cecilia is talking about? I look and have looked over you know, a decade at students coming through, um, uh, you know, a master's program at Columbia. And, you know, there have not been um, all that many students of, of color that are that are American um, coming through. Um, and, and I'm wondering, you know, graduate school and a graduate education is a big investment. And it, it feels like um, an industry that might not have been part of their lives and something that they're exposed to. They may have been exposed to tech or something else in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, Ernst, I know you've spent a lot of time thinking about this, but um, to what extent do we have an obligation as people in the industry to kind of encourage and identify that talent stream to fill up the spots that Cecily and Cecilia are talking about and opportunities for people to tackle the complexity of building in a different way? Yeah, I think I think the big investment has to be made once they've graduated and they have that piece of paper. Uh, you know, you have such talented people uh, that will never be given that opportunity that for equity investment, right? It's like, um, you know, when 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 just to be frank, when black people do development, it's really through. Uh, hard money lenders, right? Who take zero risk, who take whatever small amount of money that they may have, uh, takes that as a down payment. And, you know, they, I've watched hard money lenders because, you know, before you can actually act, you have to kind of study what people do. And I've watched hard money lenders, you know, say that down payment is based on how much money can they take from you to put you in a stress situation. Right. They'll take your financials and everything. And, you know, they never tell you, is it 20 percent they want down, 30 percent, 40 percent? That number is fluid because, you know, if you've got 40 percent, you know, they're going to ask for 45 percent. They want to put you in a stress situation so that any kind of mistake you make, like they get to take those dollars and they basically wipe you out. They're like, you know, hedge funds, right? It's like the, the, the whole goal of that is to make you stress. You have all the, you know, risk that you're taking. They're taking zero risk. And that's why they call that those kind of dollars loan to own. Like it's, it's a science, right? And that's usually what's available to, um, to people of color, to in particular black people. So whenever they've gotten involved in real estate, they tend to lose. And people think, well, that's because you're black. You know, you're my example. You're black. You can't do it. You're not talented. And then you turn around and you have, you know, a white person get into real estate. Uh, you know, they can uh, they can mit Romney it, right? It's like, hey, you know, you're my son. Here's here's a big check. Go and do it. And you know. I mean, like if someone gives you a big check and you're starting out with equity, you're not going to fail. Like overall, if you've got any kind of understanding of the real estate market and you've got, you know, favorable capital, you're going to do well. Uh, and so, you know, we, we, we build our models on, you know, the, this person tends to fail, this person tends to succeed, but then we don't look at like the circumstances behind that. And so, you know, one of the things we've done about it is we've created this fund, the AQUA fund. And the point of that is 
when you when you're so talented and you're a woman and you're of color and you're an immigrant someone should hand you a check that says equity right like you don't have if you've got fifty thousand dollars a hundred thousand dollars two hundred thousand dollars in the bank keep it in the bank we're gonna mit Romney you we're gonna give you equity and we, we want to see you uh do well and you know the past few months that we've been doing this um you know the women incredible women that we've been working with the incredible people of color and immigrants that we've been working with they're doing 20 to 25 percent better than their white male counterparts and so this is completely blowing out the theory well only white men do well in real estate and i think that's what we have to do we've got to show that there's incredible talent uh in all people and we've got to finance them at a level playing field, right? And so you have traditional banks that, you know, go into a particular zip code and suddenly their interest rates go up because they say risk. But then over time, you realize there's actually less risk in that community. It's just, they're, they're no better than the loan to own people. I mean, it's still the same, you know, we want to get to our answer. And our answer is money should go to elite white men, right? And so if that's the answer, these traditional banking system and the traditional real estate system wants to get to, they are gonna do everything in their power to make sure that they sabotage everyone else. And so in a city like Baltimore, that's less than 20% white male, uh, it's probably 17 or 18%, 19, 90, not 19, 90% plus, of the investment in real estate went to a handful of elite white men. I mean, how does that happen? And we find a legal way to do that because we call it underwriting. We, whatever we call it, it's racist, it's sexist, and it's xenophobic. And we've got to recognize that and pivot away from that. It's interesting. Cecily, do you want to say something? Well, I, you, I, you go ahead first. I wanted to comment on the pipeline question that you asked too. Yeah, go, go ahead. Okay, so for me, I think one of the things about real estate is I feel like it's almost the real estate developer developer is this enigma I found when I'm having conversations with people about real estate. Um, I've worked for the city of Detroit. Um, and so when you're, you're, you're sitting in a community meeting and you're bringing a developer, what does that mean? I mean, I think people automatically clam up there. There's a, a, there's just a, there's a very visceral reaction to the word real estate, to the word developer. And I, I'm, I'm always, I'm struck by it because in our everyday lives, we interact with real estate, whether we think about it that way or not. It's where you live, it's where you shop, it's where you go to school. It's it's so many different things, um, but it really is just referring to the built environment. And so I don't think, I think one of the most important things that we could do when we're thinking about the pipeline and exposure is demystifying what real estate really is. It can be so many things, even on this panel, like the background of planning or engineering or building it's it's not just the developer, the, the white man developer earns that you're talking about, but there's so many different layers and ways to be involved in real estate. So I think understanding what it is, the components that make up it, and the, even you know public sector versus private sector versus nonprofit, I think that would go a long way in even just introducing it. And that's I think that's far before you go to grad school. I think I made the decision to go to grad school because I knew what real estate was, not to find out about it. You know, so I think that where we insert that in the pipeline conversation is really, really important. You know, it's it's very interesting. And um, one of the things I've been thinking about is as you, I, I teach a history of real estate development in New York. And one of the things I think about is those big um, kind of mega projects that have shaped certainly New York and have shaped other cities too. Um, and, and the fact that, um, and this is really, I'm sort of thinking about you, Cecilia, and representing the public sector. Um, we undertake those these projects for whatever reason, whether it's the World Trade Center or it was Rockefeller Center was actually private, or it's a Hudson Yards or something else, because we're thinking big and we think we want to transform an area. We want to do good. We want to transform an area. We want to bring investment into it. But the projects sometimes are of such complexity and such size that anybody who doesn't have deep pockets isn't well versed in how you negotiate with government, can't really participate. I've seen this up close and personal from my time at EDC. And so the reason I'm responding um, 
to, to, to you with this, Cecily, is in some ways, these sorts of projects and the tie to these sorts of developers that do them is what gets in the news. It's people associate with developers because they think, oh, the developer of whatever it is, whether it's Hudson Yards that's in the news or somebody else who's, you know, looking for some kind of break or trying to put up a very big tower over Grand Central or whatever. That's what they think about when they think about developers. And they do tend to be large projects. They're extremely well financed and they're generally led by white men. So it's not a crazy thing that people, you know, look at it this way because as a society, we aggregate these projects for maybe for good city planning reasons, because we think we should think about uh, the Western and Eastern rail yards together as one project, as one neighborhood, but we end up in a mega project um, to whom only the largest can be granted admission. And that's effectively what happened in that case. And it's happened in other cities. It's not just New York thing. And I don't know, you know, from a planning perspective, whether there are ways to think about these sorts of projects transformational projects in places that that would um, provide essentially um, a wider um, entryway for some of these smaller developers that you've been talking about, Ernst, and you've been referring to, Cecily, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really important question. Um, look, I think like, I, I to me, it is less about the scale because there are some like issues or some projects that need to happen at a large scale. I mean, in New York City, one enormous city in the middle of an enormous region. And so there are sometimes like types of transformation like we're doing right now, like a huge kind of climate change project in Northern Manhattan. Like, well, you can only make a solution that like actually has a sense and a purpose at that scale, like at the scale of like 25 blocks. That is just, you know, how it needs to happen. I think though the issue we've had in the profession is that we define success based on like physical transformation and just like almost like the pace and the volume of physical transformation was seen as success on its head, like on its own. And I think like where we need to shift, I mean, like for me, planning is a human science. It is about changing human outcomes. Like we know how to build a building. We've been able to build buildings for like centuries now. So unless you're just a horrible planner and a horrible developer, eventually something will come out of the ground and with Department of Building Regulation, it will stand there for multiple generation, you know? Um, but it's like, how, how is the work actually doing two things? One, affecting the communities that exist today or potentially like the communities that will come to um, live in these new places that you're creating. So I think you need to have like a very value-driven, human outcome-driven um, sense of what success looks like that forces you to continuously judge whether or not you are going in the right direction or you are being like blinded by, you know, the physical transformation in front of you. And then I think like, and we're beginning to come into that realization, any time that you, we spend money or the private sector spend money has to be an opportunity to uplift people. It just has to. So you have to find processes by which you're doing that and you have to hold yourself accountable in that way as well. So if you're, if the city is, you know, spending a, a really large amount of money over a long period of time or just resources in planning and like physical transformation, it has to translate in the number of jobs that come to this local community, has to translate the number of jobs into like, like smaller firm that otherwise, you know, and this is their, their chance to be able to like get into a large project and like be a bigger firm on the other side of that project. Like these have to be also like kind of key goals and you have to be measured against these outcomes as well. Although, you know, are, are what you're saying is as you look at big projects, and I'm really talking about the real estate industry here because that's what this conference is about. Are you suggesting that as we think about these things, I mean, look, you know, banks have to do their community based lending or they can't continue to operate in certain, you know, areas, you know, should the public sector have um, a similar onus to encourage and support uh, smaller real estate developers of color who don't have the resources and essentially carve out 
part of these projects for their participation? I'm asking a theoretical question. I'm not it's not theoretical. Talking. It's actually it's a real question, right? And so I think the way the public sector looks at it is trickle down, right? It's like they're all Reaganomics, right? It's like let's give it to the big developer because we don't have to work, right? And I, I don't want to say it in a very hostile way. It's like no, let's give it to the big developer and then let's let them bring along some other people. And that's not going to work. It's like we find out how to give big developers all sorts of TIFs and bonds and all sorts of stuff. And then the small developer comes in for a little bit of subsidy and we can't, we apply the same method from the big developer. Right, and we we the same application process, the same everything, and we know that the small developer is not going to succeed just based on those hurdles. Like they don't have the attorneys, they don't have the accountants, they don't have the back office to do that. So, like in a sense, it's like I always look at it as like, how is it that my own taxpayer dollars is used to oppress me, right? And like that's essentially what happens, and like. Communities actually don't want large scale, huge 25 block redevelopments happening to them because that's how they get lost. That's how they get abused. And, you know, I think a lot of government really, that's the only way they, they, they actually think bigger than the developers, right? It's like, let's, let's, let's not do small scale you know, development in the Bronx and let's involve people in the Bronx and let's make sure people from the Bronx are, are hired. It's like half the employees are coming from Staten Island, coming from like other places. And I think our union system, and I don't actually, maybe I don't want to get into that, but I, I think if we apply this, it's go big or go home, we know who we're excluding, right? We've got to create a pathway for people to get in and you know, I had to kind of congratulate the CDFIs. Someone brought up CDFIs earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we work with reinvestment fund. We work with uh, enterprise community loan fund to create pathways for folks. And I'm not saying the big project is not like, cause like we do big projects. We do seven acre, 13 acre projects. And I would have never been able to do those type of projects if I didn't get the opportunity to renovate a few row houses in Philadelphia when I was 22, a couple of row houses in Baltimore. It all starts somewhere. And you can, in one generation, in one lifetime, you can go from row houses to building towers. And I, that's what, you know, I'm, personally want to do and so how do you create the pathways and I think they that could be a parallel path that we follow and we've got to look when when we're dealing with the small scale developers and I congratulate EDC because they've created this loan fund because that is a pathway in and then you really want to give that small developer that's proven they can take that loan fund and do something with it they can take equity and do something with it well what's next can they do a small mixed use and so with our AQUO fund and with, you know, what government is trying to do at, you know, the EDC level and other organizations like that in Baltimore and Philadelphia, how do we create a pathway for people, like developers shouldn't be, um, you know, people that don't care, like, you know, they should be more like planners, right? They should care about the people that they're developing for. And if they don't, then we should find a way to ignore them. We should find a way to turn our backs to them because they're not like long-term, they're just gonna extract from our communities. And, you know, unless you learn to, you know, understand that you have like a role, like, you know, the, the problem with development is that it's not like being a doctor where you take an oath that says do no harm, right? It's not like being a lawyer where there's a bar that you pass and then there's a certain code and if you don't uh you know adhere to that code you could get disbarred right development is i've got money i've got contacts i can be a developer and worse my dad was a developer and like and now i don't know what to do with my life i'm a developer like that's the worst thing we could do and like and and developers affect the world and our communities more than doctors more than lawyers because we build the, the built environment and like, and if, and if we do it wrong, we, 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 we kind of marginalize people, 
right? And so developers should be women. They should be people of color. They should be everyone. They should be all talented people. It should be a meritocracy. And the way to do that is to create pathways. And I, and I think that's what EDC is trying to do. And that's what I think, you know, Cecily and I are trying to do by just being examples of people of color that, you know, happen to also be intelligent. She's actually more intelligent than I am, but like being able to show that we can be successful developers and it's not through handout. When I told someone about the AQUO fund, they're like, you know, and I said, the second I said women and minorities, they're like, is that some sort of grant program, right? So we've got to stop thinking of women and minorities as people we give handouts to. And we start thinking of people we make investments with and we make money and, you know, we got to leave greed off the table, essentially. Great. You know, I'm looking at these um, at these two female faces um, that are, are listening while you're talking, or instead thinking that this is the right moment to wrap up this panel, having decided that um, we need to empower, um, you know, developers of color and women. Um, but also, I love the idea that the word developer is something we need to look at. Um, and and try to make people understand that it isn't something pernicious, that it's somebody who is shaping the built environment. We don't consider people who construct things bad people, um, but somehow the, the word has gotten caught up with a lot of associations that probably are um, not reflective of the complexity and the goals of, of the people who are doing it. So um, on that rather philosophical note, in search of a new word for developer, I wanna thank all you guys for being on the panel. I think it's been a super interesting discussion. Um, and thank you all to the audience who's been, who's been listening to us. Many thanks.